Welcome everyone. I think we've got um, enough people here to get started. So welcome everyone to this session on the seminar on um, vaccine diplomacy. This is the will be the last session that we run or last seminar we run on vac the topic of vaccines. We'll be moving on to other topics after this. This today's topic is a really great topic, really interesting and timely, and we've got uh, three great speakers to uh, to start the discussion. Uh, before I start, though, just a couple of practical uh, things to remember. The first thing is that this session is being recorded um, and it'll be distributed in a number of ways, which you'll, you'll hear about in the chat. Um, most importantly, it's going to be uh, made available through the Epidemics Ethics uh, website. Um, important to be aware of that. Just in terms of practical, other practical things, um, if you have a question for any of our speakers today or just a topic you think we should discuss that we haven't, please can you use the Q&A for that one. So you'll see that button at the bottom of the page. If you want, to, we won't be monitoring the chat in the same way. So if you want to get a question to us, please can you use that function? You're welcome to use the chat as some people already are just to say hello, to say where you're from and that kind of thing. Um, but if you want to get a question to us, you'll need to use the Q&A um, session. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce, introduce the session and uh, say something about our speakers and then we'll, then we'll get started. So, as I mentioned earlier, the topic of the seminar today is on the ethics and other issues associated with vaccine diplomacy. We've had a lot of discussion over the last year, but of increasing intensity recently about a number of ethical issues related to vaccination. We've had discussion, for example, a lot of discussion around the idea of a um, number of issues to do with vaccine hesitancy. We've had issues to do with the idea of vaccine discussions about issues related to vaccine passports. We've had discussion about the distribution of vaccines at the level of global level, equity questions and so on. But one thing we haven't talked about really is an increasingly important phenomenon, which is the use of vaccines and the export or not of vaccines in international relations of one kind or another. So the idea of vaccine, vaccine diplomacy is something I think we haven't touched on. And yet, nonetheless, that clearly becoming an important, an important issue. So that's the topic we're going to focus on today. Uh, in a moment, I'll hand over to our first three speakers. But first of all, I just want to introduce them all now at the beginning before we start. So you're, you know who they are. And so our three speakers are, our first speaker is going to be Professor Annalene Bradenor, who is Professor of Ethics and Biomedical Innovation and Head of the Department of Medical Humanities at the U University Medical Center in Utrecht. She's been a member of the Senate of the Dutch Parliament since 2015 and floor leader since 2019. Her research, consultancy and teaching is focused on, the, focused on the ethical issues in emerging biomedical technology and translational medicine. And she's been de deeply involved in the number of ethical challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic in the Netherlands. She's written about a whole range of issues to do with clinical trials research and has been interviewed widely on topics such as vaccine ethics. That's our first speaker is Professor Annelene Bradenbaum. Our second speaker is Professor Kamanthri Moodley, who's a professor in the Department of Medicine and director of the Center of Medical Ethics in Law and Law, sorry, at the Department of Medicine in Stellenbosch University in South Africa. In 2017, she was appointed adjunct professor, Department of Med Social Medicine, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in the US. Kamanthri has been actively involved in addressing the ethical challenges of COVID-19 in South Africa, in Africa more broadly, and the fair allocation of vaccines in, in South Africa. And finally, our third speaker is Professor Francoise Bayliss, who's a professor of NT Impact Ethics at the Faculty of Medicine, Dalhousie University in Canada. She's a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of Nova Scotia, as well as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Medical Sciences. In 2017, she was awarded the Canadian Bioethics Society Lifetime Achievement Award, Award. And Francoise has been at the forefront of COVID-19 ethics and public policy issues and has published and been interviewed widely on topics such as the ethics of vaccine certificates and so on. So I'm sure you'll agree we've got a very distinguished uh, panel today. I'm very much looking forward to their inputs and to the discussion. So as I say, please do post questions if you have them. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to each of our, pa our panelists in turn to speak for a, around about five minutes, and then we'll we'll have a, an open discussion. So, uh, Annalie, you want to go first? Thank you, Mike. Um, what I would like to do is to talk about the surprising lack of uh, EU vaccine diplomacy. This, so, vaccine diplomacy on a European Union level, and some thoughts about what should be done. And I will do this uh, as a EU citizen. I'm, I'm located in the Netherlands. 
but also as an ethicist and as member of our Senate, so also from the political perspective. Um, as you all know, many European Union countries and also other countries in the world have tried to make bilateral agreements to secure access to more doses of vaccines quite often than they have residents. And deals like these uh, have tried to mitigate risk that any uh, of the manufacturer's vaccine might fail or have serious side effects. Like the discussion we have right now with uh, AstraZeneca. Many governments defend their bilateral agreements with pharmaceutical companies by claiming that they are merely secure, securing enough doses to vaccinate their residents or because they funded COVID-19 vaccine development uh, and then they should give them entitlements to a share of the early production. Um, the European Union countries, they are a major money donor to COVAX, which is the multilateral initiative aimed at accelerating the development of COVID-19 vaccines and uh, which also aims to ensure that they are available in low and middle income countries. But the EU countries, we can see, particularly also in my country, the Netherlands, that we are struggling with our own procurement and vaccine rollout. Uh, there are many logistical problems and discussions in the EU countries are unfortunately within a framework of vaccine nationalism. Um, uh, in a uh, paper in Foreign Affairs, um, Emmanuel and colleagues, they make this distinction between vaccine nationalism and vaccine cosmopolitanism. Vaccine nationalism uh, is the view that holds that governments have a responsibility to protect and promote the rights and well-beings of their citizens. And as a result, governments are permitted, even required, to accord exclusive priority to the interest of their people. In vaccine uh, cosmo cosmopolitanism, this holds that national borders are arbitrary and of limited moral significance, and where individuals are born is out of their control and should therefore not affect the, um, the, the entrance to life-saving vaccines. Um, and I agree with them that actually neither of those positions are ethically defendable. Extreme nationalism ignores the basic moral claim of human beings beyond a country's borders, but extreme cosmopolitanism overlooks the obligations that governments and politicians also have to their residents. So I think there should be a balance mediated not through bilateral vaccine diplomacy, but by multilateral initiatives such as COVAX. But as long as the vaccines remain scarce, I think the ethical question still is, how many vaccine doses are countries individually permitted to secure for the purpose of immunize, immunizing their own residents before they are obligated to relinquish doses to other countries? And, um, there are now internationally, you can see some proposals for what is a fair uh, framework. Um, I, I think some, somewhere between the, those nationalistic and cosmopolitic views are proposals that governments are allowed to give a fair priority to their own residents to, for lowering risk until the risks are in usual winter flu situations. And when you've reached those risks, then you're morally obliged to also start sharing uh, your vaccines with other countries. And um, what you can see right now, I can, I, I, I'm ashamed to, share, to say, but what you can see in most European Union countries, we didn't reach that level yet. And the, net, the political discussions are completely focused on own countries. Uh, there is not a single newspaper in my country for the last weeks that wrote a paper about uh, uh, um, share, uh, sharing uh, uh, vaccines, also not through uh, COVAX. So I think um, there are three arguments uh, for starting EU, so not bilateral, but EU-wide vaccine diplomacy. First, it's very obvious, obvious for, uh, for an ethicist, uh, justice arguments. Uh, you can see that Corona is widening existing inequalities. Uh, I think a second argument is self-interested, uh, self-interest arguments. Uh, the pandemic will not be vanquished anywhere until it is beaten everywhere. And the third argument is geo geopolitical, soft political arguments. Um, I think the countries now will not easily forget who delivered the vaccines to them. And you can see that particularly Russia and China 
are now the first one uh, to uh, deliver their, their Sputnik and Sinopharm vaccines. Um, and I think it's important that in the already lacking EU foreign policy, it's important to now we're starting to roll out our vaccines programs. It's really important that the European Union is uh, working together and uh, investing collectively in COVAX, so not bilaterally, but as on EU level, and to start um, having their share, fair share in the international uh, supply. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Annelien. That's great. I'd love to start having a conversation straight away, but I'll mm -hmm. move on. Uh, so, uh, K Manthri, I think you're next. Well, uh, good afternoon, Mike and uh, colleagues on the on the panel. Uh, thank you for the invitation to contribute. Um, I'm going to start off um, with uh, gi giving you a little bit of context around the situation in South Africa. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have a population of about 60 million people, and we've had about 1.5 million uh, reported cases of COVID thus far. Um, now, uh, today, uh, in the last 24 hours, we've had 931 new cases and 66 deaths. So we've been through a first wave and a second wave, and uh, we are sort of anticipating that there might be a third wave uh, coming in the next few weeks, but we hope this will not be as severe as the previous two waves. Uh, clearly, in the first two waves, the country experienced a considerable amount of mortality and morbidity, and there was a genuine desperation for vaccines. So on the 1st of uh, February this year, you know, we uh, were very excited to receive uh, 1 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine from the Serum Institute of India, uh, a bilateral agreement between the South African government and the Serum Institute. Uh, what we were disappointed about was that we paid twice as much uh, per dose as European countries did. The explanation that was given was that um, the, uh, the European countries had invested in invested financially in research and development uh, of, of the AstraZeneca vaccine. The argument from the South African side was that we too had uh, contributed in the form of clinical trials in the country. And so there was a need to consider, you know, consider the role of, of participants who had participated in experimental trials early on and the role of investigators and others in securing post-trial access, benefit sharing agreements, et cetera, that would ensure a vaccine supply to the country. Well, uh, as things went with the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, there was a, a, a variant in South Africa and um, there was insufficient clinical trial data at the time to justify using the AstraZeneca vaccine. And so arrangements were made very quickly for another option. And this took the form of the Johnson & Johnson single dose vaccine. But it came to South Africa uh, in the form of a, a phase 3B implementation trial. And so our highest risk participants, our healthcare workers, were, the, were first in line to receive the J&J &J vaccine as part of this implementation research. Um, and so it was part of sort of experimental vaccine stock that actually came to the country. Uh, to date, about 288,000 of our healthcare personnel have been vaccinated with the J&J &J vaccine. We also expect that there would be future uh, vaccine doses coming in by the COVAX facility, as well as through bilateral agreements with Pfizer and J&J. &J. So there's a whole range of different mechanisms in place in terms of how South Africa, as a high middle income country, is receiving vaccines during this pandemic. The interesting thing about receiving vaccines from India is that on the side of India, it could be seen as you know, a, a form of vaccine diplomacy, but it's an unusual situation when we speak about vaccine diplomacy, because we usually think of high income countries who are going to share vaccines with lower and middle income countries as part of a vaccine diplomacy strategy. Uh, in this case, we have India itself, a low and middle income country sharing vaccines with other countries. So uh, India has a population of 1.3 billion people. 
they have already, uh, you know, and, and the, the country itself has only received 10 million vaccine doses that, that have been uh, allocated uh, to their own population. But they've given more than 64 million doses of the vaccine to 84 countries, uh, some of them via the COVAX facility, some via commercial arrangements, and some via so-called grants to other countries. Uh, the number of cases in India uh, has risen, so in recent times, to 115,312 cases per day. And I told you South Africa has only around 931 cases. So you can see that clearly India is having a much more severe uh, outbreak of, of COVID at, at this point in time. And clearly we've heard reports that they've now decided that it's important to ensure that their own population is vaccinated and completely uh, you know, understandable under the circumstances. And so this brings us to the, the issue around you know, the ensuring balance between nationalism and diplomacy. And this is, this is a really interesting example that's playing out you know, in India at the moment. I think uh, when we think about the ethics uh, issues around diplomacy, we need to think about whether, uh, you know, vaccine diplomacy generally, if we treat vaccines as a public health good, is uh, a positive uh, uh, strategy. It's important and it's to be applauded. However, if it's used, if vaccine diplomacy is used as a means to an end, and this could be uh, political or other similar ends, then one needs to be more concerned about the reason, you know, for the diplomacy, for the donation of vaccines. And of course, one needs to consider quality of vaccines and, and what vaccines are actually going to be given to other countries and whether more harm than good would, will be caused, especially where full registration or emergency use authorization is not in place. Uh, so I'm going to stop at this point uh, and happy to take questions later. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Cayman3. Um, so uh, over to you, uh, Francoise. Well, thank you. It's uh, always a challenge to follow uh, speakers who've made such excellent contributions. And I'm largely in agreement with everything that's been said. And so what I'd like to do in the time that I have is to basically share with you a Canadian perspective, so a perspective from North America. Canada is a country that does not produce vaccines. And so we are in the process of securing vaccines from other countries. And we've done that to an excessive extent. Uh, depending on how you count the pre-orders, we have ordered enough vaccine for more than 10 times our population. So in that context, a number of people, myself included, have been arguing very strongly for our government to make plans now for the equitable distribution of excess vaccines. But an interesting thing for us, a challenge for us, is to actually understand what excess is going to mean, given that we don't actually produce vaccine. In that context, one of the things that I think is worth sharing is that I have taken a position arguing that Canada needs to think about gifting in creative ways. We have made contributions to COVAX and we should continue to do that. But I've actually argued that we have a duty of reparation towards specific countries and I've identified the Caribbean and Mexico. So I'm actually making a claim there that our government owes them vaccine. And I ground that because we actually, we meaning our government, made a decision at the end of January to cease all flights from Canada to Mexico and to the Caribbean. This was done for reasons that I think are laudable, meaning to protect Canadians and also to protect the people in those countries so that you're not encouraging or increasing the spread of the virus. So I don't question that decision. But I think our government has to then recognize that you have had a direct harmful impact on these countries because almost all of their GDP depends on tourism and we are one of those major contributors. So this uh, period is going to last three months. So no flights in or out of those countries are allowed from the end of January to the end of April. And in that context, I'm saying, if those flights resume, and we believe that we have a population that is sufficiently vaccinated, it's not sufficient for us to think, well, 
great. Canadians are safe. They can travel again to these places without actually taking responsibility for the populations in those countries where you anticipate Canadians might now be going. So it's an unusual kind of argument, but I want to say that I think it's really important for countries to look around and to think where they've made specific strategic choices that have had a direct harmful impact on other countries and to understand that they then have obligations. But what I do also want to say, which I did say at the beginning, I think there's a very specific and different kind of obligation to contribute to COVAX. And the reason for this is so that you do not actually end up, if you will, with the risk that your gifting is somehow connected with a desire for influence. And I think that's what most people are worried about when they talk about vaccine diplomacy. People are not worried about gifting. They're worried about the motivation behind the gifting and whether or not this will become a sort of form of influence in a particular region. And in the media, we're hearing about that in the context of initiatives by China, responses by the United States, Japan, Australia, uh, and India. And that is all about political jockeying. And I think here, if I can, I'd like to just end with a comment where I try to draw an analogy between the problem we have named in other contexts between philanthrocapitalism, where what happens is people who are extremely wealthy have a disproportionate impact on decision making and policy and priorities by virtue of their gifting, as contrasted with paying your taxes and allowing the governments that are in place to set those priorities. And I think that that's what we're seeing right now. This attempt to use access to something that's extremely important at this moment in time in the context of a pandemic, i.e. vaccines, to purchase in effect influence in certain areas, which means ultimately to be having an impact on priority setting and decision making, as contrasted with gifting to COVAX, where it's equivalent to my way of thinking of paying your fair share of taxes and allowing somebody else to set the legitimate priorities. Thank you. That's great, Francois. Thank you. So I've got a couple of questions in the chat and I've got a couple of I've sort of pre-prepared, but I just I guess one thing I wanted to do to start off with, and you've you mentioned it there, Francois, to some extent. I mean, when I, when I think about vaccine diplomacy, I think about what you're just talking about, which is the use of the distribution of vaccines and those kind of relationships to to exert influence other than simply things to do with addressing disease and so on. So it's about those kind of, the, and you and you could imagine a range of uses, some of them that we might be very happy about and some of them we might not be happy with. I just wondered if I could just put you all on the spot and say, do you think, maybe Annalene, because you, you mentioned the cosmopolitanism thing, to what extent do you think, do you think it's completely illegitimate to use vaccines in to do things beyond, to, as it were, to exert influence or 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 are there times when that might be the right thing to do or be acceptable possibly? Well, I think in the ideal world, we wouldn't do bilateral vaccine diplomacy because I'm, I'm convinced that it's not only humanitarian, but that it's used for, uh, for soft power, geopolitical influence. Uh, so in the, in the ideal world, we would use uh, COVAX and we all have our fair share in uh, providing money and vaccines and distributing it in this way. You can see, for example, Serbia, for example, which is not a European Union country, but who is making uh, negotiations for already years to become part member of the EU, uh, is one of the front runners uh, due to Russian vaccines. I don't think that's a coincidence that they got many Sputnik uh, vaccines from Russia. That's also a part of diplomacy or buying soft power. And I, I think the um, European Union might be a bit naive in, in running these kind of programs. So in, in the end, I think, I would prefer doing it through COVAX, but I think in reality, um, uh, you cannot, uh, you'll have to join uh, uh, doing a certain part of uh, the uh, vaccine diplomacy. But most EU countries, by the way, are not producing a vaccine. So the only thing we can do is provide money. Hmm. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Kim Anthony, do you have any thoughts on that? Whether it's just illegitimate to use vaccines to achieve other ends, other non-medical ends? Well, uh, Mike, you know, we've all been stuck. We have the ideal ethics approach to everything. We had it pre-COVID. And during COVID, I mean, many of the, you know, the things we previously thought had to be done in a specific way have been turned over completely. Uh, what I do think is that uh, 
to use vaccines purely for uh, geopolitical reasons um, uh, to me would not be acceptable. I think one would prefer that any sharing of vaccines or gifting of vaccines is done you know, with the principle of solidarity and the need to help and social justice. You know, that would be the basis that would be uh, ethically acceptable to me. Um, what is going on in various parts of the world now is to a large extent unacceptable. Uh, you know, where countries are, are, are choosing specific country, other countries that they wish to share vaccines with um, and that there are various uh, political uh, uh, aspects attached to the gifting. So uh, that, that to me is, is not, not acceptable. Uh, I do think the COVAX facility is excellent, but it might be a wee bit slow because vaccines are just not getting out fast enough. And although that is the preferable way in terms of, of ensuring uh, more equitable distribution of vaccines around the world, uh, the, the slowness of the process and the urgency to receive vaccines at other ends is probably, you know, uh, pushing people over the edge in terms of accepting all kinds of other arrangements that that may not necessarily be based simply on, on sol solidarity or social justice. Thanks. Thanks very, thanks very much. Uh, Francoise, do you have, any, have anything to add? Well, I just want to emphasize um, the comment about the commitment to social justice and solidarity. I do think that when you're faced with ethical challenges, you ought to ground them in solid, robust ethical principles. And I think those two are certainly ones that I would have at the forefront. But I do think that I actually want to add to that the one I alluded to before, which is, has to do with duties of reparation. When you've introduced a policy during the time of the pandemic that you know will have a direct harmful effect on other countries, I think you have to think about how you're going to try to mitigate or reduce or redress the harm that you know you're directly responsible for. So I think that's what I was trying to add when I said that I think there's an obligation to both contribute to COVAX, but also to look around and see where has your government made choices where it could have made different choices, but you think they were the right choices to make, understanding there will be harms and how can you then try to redress or you know, at least try to mitigate some of those harms. So I think we need a multifaceted approach. I gave you the example of where I think Canada's policies have had a direct harmful impact. And I think if other countries looked around, they might find practices or policies they've put in place that have been directly harmful. So I think that's the one thing I'd like to say. Um, if I can though, I'd like to just maybe share a bit of a story that I think would be interesting or helpful which is that um, I think what we're all concerned about is the geopolitical framing of some of the gifting and the, the worries that this uh, creates for us. And something that I think people may not be well aware of is that in the early days of the pandemic, when we were looking for vaccine, so going back to May of 2020, the National Research Council in Canada had actually signed a deal with CanSino in China. And CanSino was to ship their company's candidate COVID vaccine actually to our facility here in Halifax, where we have the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology. And, you know, I can tell you, we were excited thinking that we were going for the first time to actually have something collaborative with China and that we were going to run a phase one trial. Now, what's interesting is that that agreement was announced on May the 12th of 2020. On May the 19th, China Customs refused to allow the shipment to leave China. And over the next ensuing months, that whole deal fell apart. Now, what's interesting to me is to reflect on how might history have been different if you actually had had a Canadian-Chinese collaboration? Um, and I think what's interesting there is that China did sh ship its candidate vaccine to a number of other countries, um, but not Canada. So what is that about? Mm. Right, really very interesting. I think, I mean, one of the things that has come out of the, that conversation as a whole, I think, is a way, is a sort of uh, the need to think about vaccine diplomacy in at least two different ways. So one, the way we tended, I think, to frame this discussion to begin with, I mean, the, the organizers of the meeting, was in terms of these kind of using vaccines to create influence at the sort of national level. Conversation, I think, is another kind of vaccine diplomacy, which might be more 
uh, something we want to support, which is the use of vaccines and to to support and enhance international arrangements, like for example, COVAX and other kind. That seems a kind of a vaccine diplomacy too, potentially. I think that's really really interesting uh, distinction. Um, one of the questions is, Simon, it's a lot of questions, so I'm trying to look at those and answer, just pay attention at the same time. One of the questions did raise, early on, raise this question about solidarity and the extent to which that is a useful concept. So I just wonder whether maybe picking up on the last two comments, bearing in mind the tension between, on the one hand, responsibilities to one's own citizens and responsibilities to the world, the cosmopolitan versus statist kind of distinction that... that to, what, to what extent is... Is, co is solidarity going to help us with that problem or is it going to essentially be a, just a description of that problem? So I just wonder, you know, if anyone has anything to... So sorry if the question or if I've rephrased your question slightly, but does anyone want to comment on that idea? Well, well maybe I would like to, to say something about it because I've been uh, thinking a while about um, the discussions in the European Union, which are so what I call more on the part of vaccine nationalism. But then also after reading some stuff, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I do hold the position that it's ethically acceptable that, that governments, um, at least in the first phases, also have their moral responsibilities towards their residents. And um, that there should be a certain degree of vaccination and there should be a certain degree of, well, having your, your society back on track again. Uh, and then the next step is uh, thinking about your, your international solidarity moral obligations. Uh, so, so, but the problem of that, of this, of this is that in the end, this will always mean that first countries start vaccinating their own residents and then they can start sharing vaccines or, or money uh, with other countries. I think that that is then the, um, uh, the disadvantage, the drawback of, of accepting that national countries do have also uh, obligations towards their own citizens. And I think y you can defend that for a certain degree. Yeah, and some of those, some of those obligations might have a solidarity element to them, I suppose. The within national... within their, their own re residence, of course. Yes, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, Okay, Mantri, were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the, the, the example of India is, is a typical one here. Um, they, they really have shared vaccines quite generously with many other countries. But now I think it's, the t it's time to ensure that you know, the, the outbreak is contained within their own country and to bring you know, infections down and to increase uh, vaccine rollout uh, locally. So uh, th there is that balancing act that needs to be you know, ensured at all times. And uh, I agree that yes, uh, uh, countries do have a responsibility to their own citizens, uh, but high income countries have a responsibility in addition to ensuring access to their high risk citizens to also ensure that they have some level of social justice in place to, uh, sh to share vaccines. So what we would want ideally is to have, you know, all high risk people around the world get access to vaccines first. So not the case where one entire country is fully, fully immunized, but rather the case where in all countries, all high-risk people are immunized. And I think global governance health organizations like the WHO, like the United Nations would probably have an important role to play in that respect. Great, thank you. Uh, Francois. You... Yeah, I think one of the things I'd like to um, you know, suggest here is I think there's two things in play that are worth thinking about in the context of this particular um, area of experience, which is that in a number of uh, conversations around global health matters, we often talk about high income, middle income and low income countries, and obviously places uh, that um, Shavosh, I can't say it in English today, um, straddle, places that straddle um, those divides. But one of the things that I think is actually interesting is to see how in this context, it's not so much um, 
the socioeconomic status of the country, but rather their uh, capacity for vaccine production. And so maybe this is an area in which we need to be thinking about vaccine producing countries versus countries that are having to purchase vaccine. And the reason I think we should start thinking in those terms is at least we're being told this is not going to be the last of the pandemics that we can anticipate many more in the coming years. And so in that context, I think we need to think about what power rests not just with high income, but rather with vaccine producing countries. And I think we're going to see as a result of this pandemic, many more countries attempting to have that capacity nationally. So I think that's one thing we want to think about. How might that change the conversation? But I also think that one of the things I hope we learn here is something quite similar to what was just said. What would the response to the pandemic have been if we had managed through a global organization such as WHO or UNESCO or others to actually come to some agreement on the ideal strategic response for who should be vaccinated first? And if we had applied that in a context where we imagine that like the virus, we know nothing about borders. So viruses don't respect borders. Why should our response be grounded in borders? So what if we could come to some kind of multinational agreement that the right strategy or the right priority setting, and that could be a very difficult exercise, but the right priority setting was such and such. And then we try to actually follow that globally. Obviously that would require a fair bit of uh, political negotiations. And I think it's time to start that's right now because we haven't done a very good job with this pandemic. What could we learn and do better the next time around? Yeah, what does what does good and inclusive and equitable preparedness, preparedness look like? Um, so Francois, I'm going to come to you, Francois, I'm going to come to you because I, with a quest, another question which we had related to your point of about uh, reparations. So, the, so we had a question from someone in the Philippines who's saying, you know, one basis, one further basis for thinking about reparations, or at least for thinking about these kind of issues, is to do with the proportion, the numbers of healthcare workers from countries like the Philippines that are working in, for the UK would be a good example of many, many. And, 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 and uh, she's asking whether you think that's a, you know, a basis on which there is an obligation that's generated for, for countries to, to focus on particular places around the world. I don't know enough about the... Um level of that uh, practice with respect to the Philippines. I know, for example, it does exist there. It also in Canada exists with respect to South Africa. And many people here worry about the fact that we're, you know, quote unquote, stealing um, their healthcare providers. So I certainly recognize that it's an issue. I don't feel like I'm knowledgeable enough to comment on that. But I do want to take the opportunity to say that this idea about um, a duty of reparations is meant to be multifaceted. And so it's not just about the example I gave, you know, with respect to what Canada might or might not owe to Caribbean countries. I have also applied that in the context of our own country. So for example, in Canada, with respect to our priority list for the distribution of vaccines, in phase one, we identified our indigenous communities. And that's because we have a duty of reparation that's built on colonial past and wrongs that have been perpetrated over a long time, which has meant that their health risks are different than the rest of the Canadian population. So I do want to have a very expansive and open idea about how far the duty of reparations could reach, um, but I just don't feel qualified to speak to that particular example. That's great, thank you. Uh, any of our other speakers like to comment? So Mike, I think if we start talking about reparations, then it could become quite a, <laughs> quite an, a complicated international exercise, taking into account the, the colonial past of Africa, just as an example. I mean, we have Francophone countries. Do we then say that France has to take responsibility for all the Francophone countries in Africa? Uh, the, the UK has responsibility for other parts of the world where they've colonized, um, you know, uh, the, the Lusophone countries in Africa, is that Portugal's responsibility? So, you know, how, how do we, um, how do we uh, make it practically implementable if we are to talk about reparation on a broad global scale? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, know that this has ever been done before and is there a specific mechanism that that could be implemented to make it work I, i'm not clear about that okay, great thanks 
Um, maybe Annalina, come to you with the next question. So that, um, I'll, I'll ask everyone as well, but maybe start with you. So the question is um, whether you think that scientists have any specific, you know, given their role in development and testing and so on of these, do you think that scientists have any particular kind of ethically important role in, in relation to this particular question about diplomacy? Oh, actually, I do think that scientists in general, uh, scientists and researchers in general, when they are collaborating with um, biotech, with pharmaceutical companies, that they should make uh, fair pricing agreements. So if you're doing the R&D for uh, a, a novel intervention or a novel vaccine, and uh, you know in advance that the price that will eventually be asked for this vaccine or intervention will be so high that it's very difficult or even impossible for countries and individual citizens to purchase the vaccine, then I think it's unethical to collaborate. So I think there are fair pricing obligations for researchers, yes. But it's difficult to put this completely in the responsibility of individual researchers. So in the end, uh, that, that should be part of teams, universities and, and uh, collect collectives. Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to speak to that one, but about the role of scientists in particular? Well, I would just say that uh, generally scientists have an obligation to be involved in policy discussions. Um, and I think that that's no different here. And there are ways in which I think what they want to be able to bring to the fore are um, some factual considerations. And I think one of the things we haven't talked about here thus far, but which is relevant in the context of the distribution of vaccines, is we know that different vaccines have different efficacy profiles. And one of the things that I think people are worried about is whether or not at the end of the day we will see um, that vaccines with lower efficacy profiles end up in certain parts of the world and vaccines with higher efficacy profiles end up elsewhere. And so I think that's a context within which the scientific community has obligations to make that information transparent, to continue to work to improve the efficacy, but to help people to understand what does it mean to have these different rates of efficacy and what will it mean for the political conversations hereafter once people make certain assumptions about what is or is not being gifted. I will say that is something that I worry about, that we will end up with a narrative that says something to the effect that um, vaccines with uh, lower efficacy are the ones that were generously given and distributed to lower income countries that did not have any capacity in terms of vaccine production. So I think it's that kind of core, uh, conversation that one can anticipate. And I think that's a place in which the scientific community has a particular um, ability to contribute, hopefully positively, to that conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so, yeah, Mike, I think you need, we need to look at what, what is also referred to as vaccine science diplomacy, um, you know, at two levels. There are the, the researchers, the clinical trialists who are testing vaccines in their countries and who um, uh, I have always argued have a role to play in negotiating for access uh, should an efficacious product be identified. There's that aspect and then there's the other issue uh, around the neutrality of scientists uh, at a global level in being able to negotiate uh, uh, for, for around science and around vaccines. And I think this dates back a long way, uh, you know, to the Napoleonic Wars in, in 1803 to 1815, um, you know, when Jenner actually pay, played an important diplomatic function uh, in terms of global affairs and science. And, uh, you know, he said then the sciences are never at war. Uh, Pasteur also uh, commented in 1888 that science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and is the torch that illuminates the world. So scientists, I think, have an important role to play because of you know, the, the neutrality of science and, and its, its effect, knowing no borders, just like the virus. You know? And so I think scientists have an important advocacy role uh, in terms of ensuring more equitable uh, access, access to vaccines. But if I can, I think one of the interesting and uh, complicating facts there has to do with um, 
the fact that you have scientists working in the private sector and in the public sector. And I know that in different countries, this has played out um, differently. So, you know, if you think back to the example I gave about Canada and its possible collaboration with Ken Sino, um, you know, much ado uh, had, you know, was made of the fact that uh, this was a company that did or did not have links into the Chinese government. And so I think that's one of the things that becomes really interesting is to actually begin to interrogate how much freedom scientists have depending on um, who pays the bill. Yeah. Can I add, I think that what Francois was saying, I think that is one of the, the, the key ethical issues at the moment about the distribution of vaccines. You can see on a, on a smaller scale that in many countries there is no discussion about AstraZeneca and whether it should be offered because, due to the thrombosis risk whether it should be offered um, to all citizens or only older than 60. And now we have the quite bizarre situation in the Netherlands that the government stopped, uh, although we already have a delay, stopped offering AstraZeneca to all people under 60, also high risk people, and also healthcare workers. So now healthcare workers were making a petition, were saying, well, just give us AstraZeneca because now it's in stock in the Netherlands because the government doesn't want to give it anymore and you're, you're creating some kind of pariahs or inferior uh, vaccines while in the end it might be inferior compared to the, the Pfizer efficacy um, and side effects but it's still a vaccine and it's still uh, uh, working and the risk is of course the risk is but it's really 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 ro uh, low risk and I'm I'm afraid that in the end countries become generous of sharing vaccines but then only uh, some of the Chinese vaccines, the, the efficacy is now said to be much lower, 50, 60 percent compared to 90 plus percent. So I'm quite af afraid that this is going to uh, happen in the coming uh, months. Yeah, and it could be there's potentially a trade off between, on the one hand, um, developing a vaccine that is going to be used globally, which I think was the original intention of the AstraZeneca group, you know, on, versus other kinds of effic efficacy. There may be actually be trade-offs that, that, you know, it's quite an interesting, the relationship between science and these things is actually quite complex, I think. One of the, several people in, this really hard to have this conversation without getting away from ethics, but I think we have to a little bit, because uh, a lot of the questions are about politics of various kinds and, uh, and, and quite a lot of practical questions as well. But one of the questions I think relates to the point that's come up a few times, which is about the future, how we think about the future manufacture of vaccines and vaccine development. So to, to, to evolve, to, to avoid some of these problems. And one solution would be to ensure the building of vaccine making capacity everywhere around the world. But that was something which was discussed a lot in the early days of genomics. You know, the idea that you want to have, vac you want to have a whole, whole load of genome sequencing and gene biorepositories around the world. And the, in the end, the decision was that this, even even amongst kind of African leaders in the field, was that would just be hugely resource, you know, a waste of resources. Do you really want to spend all your time building these places when actually what might be better would be some system for sharing? So I just wonder whether, to just to put you on the spot, to what extent do you think the solution to this is primarily about uh, broadening and improving the production of vaccines globally? As a, or, and to what extent do you think it's about mechanisms for sharing and maybe you know, legally constructed obligations of some kind or another. So I hope that question makes some kind of sense. Um, okay, Manthri, do you want to go first? Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Mike, it's, a, it's quite a, a challenging one. I know in South Africa, we all, already, we had very poor vaccine manufacturing capacity. In fact, in the whole of Africa, the only country that had man vaccine manufacturing capacity was Senegal, and they were manufacturing the yellow fever vaccine. Uh, South Africa itself now has an arrangement, you know, with Aspen, and there is a uh, uh, there's quite a lot of interest in setting up a vaccine manufacturing plant here. But when we speak about vaccine manufacturing, there's, there's the fill and finish aspect, you know, which is much more doable in many settings without requiring high technology, as opposed to the actual vaccine manufacturing process, which is, I think, uh, resource intensive, uh, financially quite expensive and one would require, you know, uh, technology transfer, etc. in order for that to happen. 
they also it also tends to take a, a considerable amount of time you know to go on to full on vaccine manufacturing capacity so i think it is certainly the pandemic has made more countries aware of the need to to be self sufficient with respect to vaccine manufacture uh, how it's going to play out i know there are so many discussions around um uh, you know, uh, uh, technology transfer, patents, et cetera, around vaccines. Uh, South Africa and India have signed a letter that's sitting with the World Trade Organization that still isn't resolved. Um, and, and I think it's got a lot to do with, we have to consider uh, various regulatory issues. So where vaccines are concerned, vaccines are biologics. And if we were to get generic vaccines, then they would be regarded as biosimilars. And uh, many of the regulatory agencies, including the FDA, doesn't really have a regulatory pathway for biosimilars. So uh, many uh, you know, regulatory issues that have to be resolved um, if we took patents away, there aren't really uh, other big manufacturing plants just ready to take over vaccine manufacture. Uh, there's this, the whole secrecy issue that is retained around vaccine development and trade secrets, etc. So from the legal and trade side, you know, lots of issues to be resolved. Um, I think it's about, you know, embarking on a slow process going forward to unravel some of these challenges uh, from the regulatory perspective, from financial perspectives, uh, technology transfers, et cetera, uh, in order for to improve, you know, vaccine manufacturing ca uh, capacity around the world. That's great. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to do in a minute is ask you each to sort of say a few words just to sort of sum up and say what you think are the most important things that you know we should take away from this this discussion. I mean, one thing I would uh, so I guess a couple of points that maybe you might want to think about when you're doing that. So one is, I think, uh, I'm just picking up on various comments and questions that people have made. So one is about the, how politically realistic this is. So, you know, lots of, uh, there has been a great, uh, some degree of solid question, you know, focus on solidarity, which has emerged out of this pandemic. But we've, but we've also had the growth of nationalism over, over many years, a whole range of different types, but, and also, um, uh, populism and and also vaccinate vaccine nationalism. So against that background, you know, to what extent realistically do you think in the next few years it's going to be possible to achieve the kind of things that we all want to see in, in this room? So that's 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 one element. The other is, I suppose, you may or may not want to say something about this, but it strikes me that your last point came out through. Or you, one of your points was, you know, this started out. We we need to remember as well that there were several hundred candidates for vaccines that were initially being developed in this mm -hmm. field, and. Presumably, that means that many of them failed. So, you know, we can't make decisions too early about which one we're going to distribute because a high proportion of them don't work. But in addition, some of the ones that didn't fail just took a really long time to come to, to be available. And, and if, we, if we waited for those, then presumably, you know, the, the situation in the world could have been much worse than it even is now. So, so one question is called a political reality against the background of the kinds of politics we've got. But also the kind of reality in relation to, you know, how much can we know in advance which vaccines and which relationships are going to be the important ones? So just some a couple of thoughts which have, I've tried to pick up from from the questions that, that I've been getting here. So maybe just go around, maybe in re, in reverse order something we did at the beginning. So maybe uh, Francois first, then came out three, and then uh, Annaline, and then we'll we'll finish up. We've got about five or six minutes to go. So Francois. Uh, great. Well, thank you. I think um, in response to sort of those prompts, I would offer the following. I think we need to think about how things can be different and how things will likely remain the same. I think the ways in which things can and will be different um, in the future is we now actually have new technology with respect to vaccine manufacturing with the messenger RNA vaccines. And I think this is going to influence vaccine production or candidate vaccines for future uh, viruses. And so I think that's one of the things that bears directly on your previous question. I don't know that you're going to have capacity in individual countries for that level of um, manufacturing. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think that's something we need to think about. Um, I think the other thing that is very real is we have failed 
um, in a number of respects with the, the response to this pandemic. And I have to believe that we're smart enough that we'll, we'll pull back and try and learn and try and do better. And one of those things is we definitely have to have a global perspective. It's a global crisis and we need a global response. We haven't done well, but we have the opportunity to start conversations now about how we would do things better. Where things will remain the same and which will be a challenge are quite frankly, local politics. Uh, local governments want to get reelected. They work on short time frames, four years, five years, and depending on where you were in that electoral cycle, some of you made, some governments made specific kinds of decisions. That's not going to go away. Um, and, you know, again, just speaking for my country, one of the legacies of this whole experience has been that because we are not a manufacturer, we're completely dependent on supply chains. Supply chains failed us, so to speak, we will be manufacturing vaccines. That would be my production. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. I'm saying that's gonna be the political response to what happened in this country. And I imagine different countries will have different local political responses. Okay, thank you, Francois. Uh, three. So I think uh, similar to Canada, Africa, many African countries have realized, you know, uh, the need to uh, develop vaccine manufacturing capacity. Uh, it's, it's a long term solution, but I think it started, it has certainly started in Africa. And that's, that's really good. Also having the African CDC, you know, uh, based in Ethiopia is, is really uh, a, an important development in terms of uh, uh, in terms of coordinating activities of this nature, uh, to get the pharmaceutical industry also to to you know um, invest in in manufacturing capacity on the continent of Africa is important, um, and I think uh, you know the the big problem for me is that the health inequity is so huge, and I can't see it re being resolved. You know even in the next 10 years. So, you know, it's, it's always interesting to have discussions around health inequity. And often, sadly, that's all, you know, that's as far as we get, we get to the discussion stage and we, we all know it's unethical and we all know it's, you know, unfair, but to, to actually bridge the divide between, you know, those countries that have high quality healthcare facilities and healthcare and those who don't, the divide is so big that I think it's going to be many, many years before we can, you know, improve, improve that to, to any large extent. And as the, the, the other important issue is obviously uh, for me revolves around the role that the WHO can play in terms of, um, you know, improving equity in terms of health, but vaccine and other distribution of other medication as well. So uh, there again, it's a discussion we have all the time, but it doesn't really improve. And the pandemic has shown this out, you know, the, the rich countries have got the best vaccines, they going ahead with their immunizations with Moderna and Pfizer. The poor countries largely have, you know, AstraZeneca, J&J, &J, the other vaccines that with lower levels of efficacy. So as we can talk about this, you know, for, for hours and days and months. The reality is the world is as it is and as we are seeing it now. And, you know, what will it take to change? I really don't have the answer to that. Thanks, Mike. Well, if you do, let, let us all know, because when you get it, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, Annaline. Well, thank you. Um, but I would like to, I'll try to, to present some realistic, but also idealistic perspective on this. But I should say that also um, being uh, Dutch, but also really a pro-EU uh, citizen, it, it has been quite disappointing also seeing as a politician well, the, the lack of uh, international coordination, the nationalistic reflexes. Um, as I said earlier, I, I do think governments have moral responsibilities uh, to their own residents uh, to protect them to a certain degree, but then uh, very, very quickly there should also, so after the local response, there should be international uh, coordination. So I think it's, it's really important that the European Union uh, is really uh, will be critical um, to itself and start on the one hand having better coordination, um, uh, is starting to build more 
uh, manufacturing facilities, not only for vaccines, but also for protective uh, masks and gear, because we got these from China as well uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, to start a EU vaccine diplomacy program and simultaneously invest in COVAX. But I think the, the most important thing is that we, last year's governments around the world, world um, reduced their investment in public health and preventing zoonotic transmission. So actually, as long as we do not uh, combat the, the origin, the causes of virus, uh, virus spread, then actually uh, this will, in a couple of years, we have the same situation. So I think that's the first thing to start with. So combating, uh, promoting public health and, uh, and preventing zoonosis. Great, thank you very much, thanks. Thanks very much to all three of you. That's been a fantastic discussion. It's amazing how much you can get into an hour and the depth of that discussion was really, really impressive. Um, hope that all of you on the call really enjoyed that. If you want to see it again, or if you want to recommend it to other people, then as you just see in the chat, this is going to be made available through the Epidemics Ethics website as a recording. So please join there. I don't yet know what the next seminar is going to be, but I'm sure there will be one and it will be really interesting. I apologize to everyone who asked questions that aren't the ones that I wasn't able to ask. There were a lot of them. Uh, so I did my best uh, to put them all together as best I could. But thanks very much to everyone. And thanks particularly to Francoise Caymanthri and Annaline. Thank you very much. And goodbye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>